Welcome to the Diffuse Podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Diffuse Podcast. My guest today is Giles Kenningham, MBE, who has a fascinating history, but I'm sure um, an even more fascinating future ahead of him. He may be best known historically for being one of the special advisors to David Cameron, uh, the Conservative Prime Minister, when he won the last election, which is 2015, I believe. Um, correct. That's correct. Yeah, good. Good memory. Um, but he's moved on to bigger and better things. And what we're going to talk about today is the subject of crisis communication. So, Giles, welcome. Thanks for having me on, Phil. So, you know, obviously we can't get away from the past bit. So we'll just we'll just talk about that very briefly because you're you started out, as I understand, as a journalist. Yeah, correct. Is yeah. that the kind of normal route that people who are in the comms world is is that in you know in political spheres, is that often how they, they move in that world? I'd say probably about a third of the sort of special advisors have got some kind of journalistic backgrounds. And I think obviously it can be useful in terms of being able to understand how the media works, being able to preempt difficult situations, being able to understand how stories might unfold and how, you know, crises erupt and how, you know, stories can keep going and going and going if they're not handled carefully. It doesn't give you all the skills you need to cross over, but it certainly gives you good grounding. And so what then, what's then kind of encouraged you to move from media into politics? Mm. Um, well, I've always had uh, a real thirst and interest in current affairs and news. Um, uh, and certainly, um, so, you know, that's why I went to journalism. I wanted to kind of be at the centre of the news agenda. Um, you know, I love stories and storytelling. And I've been at ITV News for four and a half years, and I fancied the change, but still wanted to do something which was sort of inextricably linked, intrinsically linked with the news agenda and politics is probably the closest thing to that. Um, I'm not someone who's overtly tribal at all. Uh, you know, I think it's much more about policy than personnel, but it just so happened that I like Cameron a lot. Um, I got offered a job to work for Conservatives, not for him to start with. Um, and that was at a time when he was reforming the party and giving it a good overhaul. And so it seemed like, um, you know, an opportunity that I wanted to take. And, you know, often these things only ever come, you know, you ever get the opportunity once. And I thought, you know, uh, I'd much rather sort of do it, give it a go than regret not doing it. And so if you're, if you're working in that environment, in Downing Street, in the comms world, yeah. is, is every day a crisis? <laughs> Well, I think you're one step away from a crisis. I think when you're in a government department, you can kind of take the submarine strategy, which was what Theresa May did as Home Secretary, what Gordon Brown did. And what I mean by that is you kind of come up for the big set moments, do your big set speeches, then you disappear again and you can control the news agenda a lot. In Downing Street, you don't have that luxury. You are exposed. You don't have any protection. Um, and when you know a crisis hits, it can hit you like uh, a tsunami. So... Um, you are more exposed. And I think, you know, the question which if I was to reflect back on, you know, one of the things was as prime minister, everyone expects you to have a view on everything. And actually you don't have to have a view on everything. If you're smart, you should say, look, it's not, you know, um, it's not for us to tell you what to do. You know, that, that is in my mind, the nanny state. I certainly think, certainly think looking back, we probably commented on too many issues. Um, and, and let's face it, the prime minister needs to get on with governing the country. You know, I think we're in a world now even more so with 24-hour news, you know, where it's just one relentless news cycle. You could spend your whole time doing the media, but, you know, you couldn't govern. And I'm sure, you know, we, I've written about this. People like Winston Churchill, obviously great prime ministers, probably wouldn't have survived in the age of social media because he was quite um, loose-lipped and had an acidic tongue. And similarly, you sort of think, like Sir Margaret Thatcher, it would have been a lot more difficult to govern uh, you know, we had things like the miners' strike, where you can imagine that sort of spilling out to social media and something I know you know a lot about, sort of all the different existential threats that would come. But yeah, you are a lot more exposed, number 10. You know, you know there's a tightrope. You are walking. And, you know, you certainly you talk about prices. I mean, often I think the one obvious point each week was we used to do 
a regional visit with Cameron every week, which he insists on doing and fair play to him, you know, because you are living a gilded existence. You are in a bit of a bunker in there, but, you know, for him it was important to get out and about and to try and remain in touch with public sentiment as much as you can do doing those jobs. And there was always my fear in those situations, like something can go wrong so quickly, big open spaces, as you'll know, you can get, you know, we used to have a, we used to carry a spare suit in case you've got eggs, but you know, the protester can come along. You can get doorsteps by a camera. Um, you know, if there's a camera around, everyone had a camera phone, even then back 215, 216 can be filming you. So I think those situations, there was always a recipe for disaster because, you know, it might not have been that, it might have been a bad picture. As we know, bad pictures can haunt you more than going off message thing, Ed Miliband and the bacon sandwich. I have a bit of sympathy for him that no one looks good eating, I don't think, in public, not even a supermodel. Um, and we had quite a sort of farcical situation off the back of that. We had a ban on Cameron eating in public so you can have a pint of beer. He got handed a hot dog during the election in 2015 and ate it with a knife and fork. And obviously, <laughs> <laughs> no one eats a hot dog with a knife and fork. I remember being in Beirut and we were at a school for refugees and all this food came out and there were all these photographers there. And I was like trying to stop him eating the food, but not wanting to cause a diplomatic incident at the same time. So, yeah, I think, yeah, there are obviously crises around the corner. And, you know, every word you say is obviously pulled over, a word out of place um, can set hairs running. So, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, once anyone doing those jobs, once you get in your groove, it's not too bad, but you've got to have your wits about you, sir. So when we, when we see politicians answering the question they want to answer rather than the one they're asked is that is that just a kind of tactic that they all get taught then is it that you know obviously you've got to get your point across and so try and control the narrative in that respect yeah it's a classic kind of pivot you know acknowledge British comments so you know that's a really really good question Phil but the question that you should be asking or the question which goes to the heart of the issue is this um I mean sure point I think politicians have to be careful because people are sick of um, uh, identical politicians rolling out anodyne sound bites. And that really explains the rise of Trump and Boris because they are more free flowing. Um, you know, in Trump's case, I say not very sophisticated, but people don't want to hear those bland sound bites. They want people to speak their mind. Mm -hmm. And actually, the mistake politicians sometimes make is that the public don't mind. Do they actually like it when you say I've screwed up because they appreciate everyone's human? But when you're trying to swear black is white, um, that does annoy them, and you know, and rightly so. So I think you know, actually trying to, you know, address the question as much as possible is really is really important. But obviously, yeah, it is a it is a game of back and forth. And you know, some politicians, some people, you know, who get really nervous doing this interview, put those interviewers on a pedestal. And you know, you've always got to remember it's a two way street, and they've got to conduct an engaging interview which engages the audience at home. And, you know, I used to say to the politicians when we were advising them, if you keep getting interrupted during the interview, just turn around to the interview and say, look, I'll do you a deal. You don't interrupt me uh, when I give my answers. I won't interrupt you when you um, ask your questions because it is a bit of a power battle and a dynamic. So it's about trying to get that, get that pitch right in the process. But, yeah, I think generally with Cameron, what we try to do, you know, probably successfully and unsuccessfully at the time, but he was quite good at rising above the politics. Obviously, PMQs would require the sort of punch and duty knockabout, which you needed to do more to keep your party happy. But when he was doing, you know, other interviews outside the chamber, it was very much trying to rise above the politics. Don't do the petty political point scoring. Because that's why people quite liked him. Like, they didn't see him as that partisan figure. I don't think beyond your kind of base, if you're going to be elected to be prime minister, you've got to be, yeah, you've got to obviously have a wider reach. Mm. So... You then kind of change change career or pivot slightly, I suppose, into the corporate sector with um, with Trafalgar mm. strategy. Was was that something that was on your mind before the election, or or, or you know, was it dependent about what was going to happen? Um, I'd always wanted to do run my own business, and that could have been running a pub. Uh, I still have a still have a. This is kind of one of those things. Where I think time has passed. I wanted to run a comedy club uh, <laughs> once upon a time. Uh, and it transpired this was the easiest thing for me to do, you know, low overheads, you can do it from your kitchen sink. And obviously I had, uh, would like to think I had a bit of the skill set to get going. So yeah, I was like throwing my cards up in the air and this was, an e you know, the easiest thing for me to do quickly, relatively low, low risk um, to get going. So yeah. And so, and so what does, what does Trafalgar strategy 
hope to achieve? What's what's the kind of mission of it? Yeah, I think, look, we like to think we're problem solvers. I think we sort of uh, operate at the intersection where politics meets business meets media. Uh, problem solving use, using communications and public affairs, but also just understanding people's worlds and the different stakeholders in there. Um, uh, we've got three core areas we do, which is um, uh, corporate affairs and reputation management, so everything from people in trouble, uh, people who might need the bomb exploding, um, sometimes taking the preemptive risk, putting in the infrastructure for companies or individuals in case something goes wrong. Then we do a fair bit of litigation PR, so it's using sort of PR to leverage settlements and disputes. Uh, then we do the sort of public affairs and campaigns, so people seeking office, people in office, and then the more corporate side of that, people bidding for contract, public contracts, or people looking to get the salience of an issue raised um, uh, or want um, political intelligence. Then we do this sort of more straightforward PR, sort of promotion and protection from people entering the marketplace to people going up to sell to, to more corporate positioning. But generally, I think the three areas pretty much interact across the board. And obviously, ESG is combined in the mix there. Um, I think much more the G part of how big corporates pay the governance sides, so whether that's gender pay gaps, um, whether that's the makeup of their boards, whether that's workers' rights. Companies and corporates need to be a lot more cognizant of it. So even if companies don't care about the political arena, have no, just don't want to have any interaction with it, they have to be careful because poor corporate behaviour can come under the spotlight of regulators quickly and obviously MPs have parliamentary privilege they can say what they want about you in parliament and you can quickly become public enemy number one and because we operate on a much you know wider canvas now with the internet there is a lot less things you can control so you have to be careful you know before it'd be like you need to get a story in the sun or in the times now you don't you know it can be a tweet which then catches on fire and becomes viral very quickly so yeah I think corporates have to be a lot more careful now and I often say to them you know, in a crisis, your internal comms is as important as your external comms because, you know, information starts leaking out during a crisis can just exacerbate it if you're not communicating um, transparently and regularly with your staff and all your stakeholders. So, yeah, so, you know, we are living in a, in a world where I suppose disruption is the new norm. How difficult is that, though, when, <clears throat> you know, we, we keep sort of stories about the younger generation i'll say younger the problem you know they may not be much younger than you but they're certainly younger than me who live by i guess kind of clickbait and sound bites on social media of of tiktok and so they're getting their news or their information they probably don't i'm making a bit of a judgment but you know there's headlines and and, and hook points rather than detail how how difficult is it to get the messaging across in that in that climate I think it's a very noisy, uh, it's a very noisy, crowded environment now. And I think, yeah, it is more difficult. I think, you know, gone are the days when just being, as I said, on the front of the sun of the times and being on the today program was going to move the agenda and move the market. It's still an important part of the jigsaw, but there are all kind of existential threats now, whether that is, you know, the rise of fake news and, you know, the impact of AI and how that's um, fueling it. The fact that, as we just said, there's a, there's a massive canvas on which people can paint. So, you know, if you are having people attack you, they don't have to do it through the papers. They can be doing it through Facebook groups, through stuff on Twitter, X, even uh, stuff on Instagram. So it's a lot more of a complex environment. And I think the issue for corporates and brands and people generally is that before you maybe you could disappear under the radar a bit now you can't so much and actually what brands and companies put out on their own platforms is going to become even more and more important as the media fragments and declines because where can you trust the information you're getting you have to say look you can only really trust if it's from us you can have to be a lot more proactive about shaping the agenda and what you put out on those platforms but similarly equally you've got to be I'm monitoring a lot more what's being said around you online, you know, whether people are looking to smear or undermine you. But with with, with agendas changing so rapidly now, and and mm. you know, people call it wokeism or whatever else, is it is is there a risk of becoming very vanilla and actually nobody really expressing themselves or or taking a strong view on something at the risk of of upsetting or harming somebody? If not yeah. now, then maybe in two years or three years. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult balancing act, right? Because it'd be a very dull world if we didn't disagree, if there wasn't, you know, a diverse range of views around any table. And, you know, 
we should have that and that's important for a sort of thriving democracy but people have to be careful because you know stuff which is on Twitter or Facebook X remains there for life I mean you see some of the stuff which you know university students are putting up on I'm like you're crazy because you're you know your future employer is going to go through that see that you know and there's literally of no benefit this sort of need to, there is this kind of among certain groups this need to document every single thing they're doing from like what they're eating to where they're going go actually is that very helpful to you um yeah it is, it is a top to world because you know you have this situation to a point where brands also expect to have a view on a lot of things mm. and so i'm just like actually it's not your place to be talking you know about some of this stuff to start it but they feel like they have to have a view on it sometimes that comes from the start pushing up mm. but you know i don't think that you know necessarily big corporate should be wading in depending what it is into sort of critical social issues where they don't really have expertise but i know that some of them do feel often when there's a big crisis for, oh, we've got to have our staff saying, what's our view? What's our view on this? It's like, well, actually, I think you should kind of stay out of it, to be honest. So, yeah, it's it's a complex canvas. It's not, you know, as ever, it's not one size fits all. It's interesting. There's, there's, I don't know if you're familiar. There's a, there's a protective intelligence organization in the US that I do a lot of work with called Ontic. And they produced some data wow. about a year ago or so, which said, with respect to CEOs, whether you say something or whether you don't say something, you're going to get targeted. Mm -hmm. And so it all, you know, the statistics were, it's kind of irrelevant. Whether you do it or you don't, someone's going to be upset and someone's going to come for you. So you're probably better off not saying anything because at least you can defend saying nothing or you can come up with something to say rather than saying something and getting it wrong. Yeah, I mean, I know that I've, I know when there's been like, um, you know, very tragic sort of murders of people and big companies thinking that they should be putting comments out. It's like, well, I think you've got to make for them. I'm like, right. Firstly, make sure you're safeguarding. You know, policies are in place. Um, what are you doing to protect staff? You know, all the sort of basic stuff from you know, if female staff can get home late at night. Your taxi policy, but be careful to be wading into some of these stories because you look opportunistic and you haven't got. You know, you're not the police. You're not a. You know, you're not. A, you're not um, an agency equipped to do with this, and it, it could backfire quickly. But yeah, I think we live in this culture, don't we, where everyone expects a response immediately. As twenty percent of people, why haven't you commented? Why haven't you done that? And there can be a rush to judgment. Um, I remember speaking to Cameron about firing cabinet ministers when they're in a crisis, and he was always of the view that he would always let them sometimes have longer than perhaps they should have had. A, so um, they felt like they'd had natural justice themselves. Secondly, you would get a bit more loyalty when they went to the back bench. And thirdly, they would often come to the conclusion themselves that they should go. But, you know, obviously, the, you had the media on his case. And you'd have people around going, should have fired them yesterday, mm. should have sat them yesterday. And often, as you'll know, it's not necessarily that clear cut um, in those situations. And, you know, if you're going to be the kind of, you know, when it comes to leadership, the kind of person who folds at the first point of crisis, then you're not going to kind of engender any loyalty. And nor is the case is that is that good leadership. But it is difficult. I've seen, you know, ministers and that's certainly Theresa May, I think when she's under a lot of pressure, this is kind of right to, you know, to back down and fire some people, perhaps who shouldn't have been fired at the time. It's interesting. We've seen that, you know, in the last few weeks, haven't we, with with both sides, the Labour and the Conservatives being being um, called out by the media and by the opposition parties around firing someone or not firing someone and not firing someone quick enough or firing someone too quick enough. So, you know, politics becomes so opportunist. You can almost never win because the yeah. other side are always going to say what you did was wrong and, you know, the kind of politically motivated media are always going to take a view on whatever you do is not quite right. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, it's not necessarily... You know, with the post, say take the post office scandal, which you know obviously looks horrendous and it's terrible for some of the people who caught up in it. But probably all three parties are culpable there, right? Across the board, you can't just sort of you know. But there was a rush, to like should have fired him, we got to sack him for it, got to sack him for it. It's like, well, okay, but probably a, um, you know, there are, it it goes back years. And secondly, what are we going to solve from doing that? But it's a kind of like rush to judgment that actually solves it. They're probably or infrastructure and institutional problems we need to get to the bottom of here. I think obviously the inquiry is there to do that. But yeah, it's um yeah, it's it's not as straightforward as everyone thinks. And yeah, I don't think it really benefits people in the long term just firing people because but there needs to be a scalp. So when so when 
you know, an organization comes to you? I mean, how, what percentage of organizations come to you, as an example, proactively to say there isn't any crisis right now, but what we want to do is get our comm strategy really well. We want to make sure that we are um, saying and doing the right things around these kind of important areas. Do, do people do that or, or is, is it always crisis? Yeah, no, no, it's probably like a good 50% to come and say, we want to get our positioning right and where do you see you know where do you see potential problems down the track where are the bear traps where do we need to stay clear of you know what do we need to do if there's a data hack if there's a cyber attack if this happens if that happens so yeah i just think certainly you're seeing now more and more though an environment where people are a lot more exposed just because as we said there's a bigger canvas that people can paint on so everyone's got a camera phone everyone can be a journalist so quite quickly things can unravel so if someone's misbehaving in the workplace or doing something which um, you know, falls, you know, pats below the sort of necessary standards of people, and whether it's in public life or in corporate life, and they can quickly unravel. Um, uh, you know, and even some it's, you know, even, even you know, you sort of see classic thing about people being fired by text and things like that, where there's a complete uh, empathy gap in how they sort of conduct and sort of look after look after their staff. So, yeah, it's, it, is, it is much more of a, a tricky tricky canvas and yeah it's difficult, difficult did you for, did you did you, did you did you did you see that then in Bre- in the brexit period or sorry in the brexit the covid period then when you know businesses were doing that where because we couldn't see each other face to face the the kind of mechanisms for communication was perhaps not what it might be and and they were you know there were stories of people being sacked by text or or all that sort of thing. Was, was, did, did, were you seeing spikes in issues then? Yeah, some of that stuff, certainly. Um, and you know, issues around people being paid um, and, you know, some issues of people being stuck abroad trying to trying to get home and the stuff, stuff that came with that. So, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I also thought from a crisis point of view, the COVID the COVID story was interesting. I had some sympathy with the government because obviously the situation was unprecedented, but equally it's quite an interesting case study, I think, in terms of managing an ongoing crisis. So they used to have the press conference every day at 5 p.m. I think it was 4 or 5 p.m., which was designed to sort of hit the 6 o'clock bulletins. But I think the problem with that approach was you'd have eight hours in the run-up to the bulletin of just wild speculation. And I thought what they should have been doing was in the morning, they should have had a press conference as well, where they put up one of the scientists, said, we're not having a politician. You know, you take politics out of it, but they just filled all questions. I think during COVID, pretty much everything should have been on the record in a public health crisis. Having background off the record briefings, unless it's really sensitive, wasn't helpful because it just fueled panic and fear. So in those situations, you know, you need to give more and more to the media. You need to have high levels of transparency and you do need to feed people because you've got that. Then you have the backdrop, which I don't think we saw a lot, but obviously that kind of coincided with, you know, the sort of, explosion of fake news ai conspiracy theories going on online i think you know i've read somewhere that there's still like these groups you know who still think covid is a big hoax and a big conspiracy and that's a problem so i think yeah i think actually you're you're trying to grapple with that situation but in these sort of situations like that you know you need to be on the front foot and you need to be doing more rather than less and it is a case of reassuring people in you know and that is someone saying i don't know but actually just being there to try and reassure them i think um the public don't expect is it politicians that don't expect politicians to have all the answers that's the thing that's the mistake they make they just want candor with it mm. and i think that 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 was i think um so interesting in that in that period also because because we're all stuck at home during the lockdown particularly there almost was no news other than COVID because no one was doing anything. And therefore, no. you know, as you say, it you, bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It became Chinese whispers and, and no one really knew what yeah. was true. And we were living on social media because it was all speculative and all that. Um, I guess it's the benefit of hindsight, isn't it? For some, but uh, clearly you were uh, uh, watching it with that, that kind of professional head on thinking, actually, if I was you, I'd be doing this. Yeah, and also I think like and the journalists are only doing their job, but obviously they want the headlines. But I would have pushed back a lot more with the media when they were like, "You need to give us a deadline." But like, no, like you know, our timetable will be determined by substance, not your artificial schedule. And we can't give you an artificial schedule because this is unprecedented and this has never happened before. And so you need to be patient with us, and we're doing everything we can. But I think there was a danger of kind of falling into the trap from the media about, you know, why wasn't this done yesterday and this is a disaster and all this kind of stuff. I think actually 
at that time, the media does have a responsibility not to be scaremongering and to be measured in their response. I think there's always a danger to hit hyperbole. I mean, one thing, and this is much more your area of expertise than mine, but the one thing that always annoys me a bit is sometimes when there has been, I think you might have been in Parliament at the time, so you'll have a much better perspective. I think there was a lone wolf a lone wolf guy who kind of charged Parliament, I think sadly killed a policeman. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Sky were calling it a terror attack within half an hour. Now, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it was a terror attack, was it? Well, technically well, it is. Know, no, technically it was a terrorist attack. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, but 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 you're right. I mean, you know, it was interesting actually from that perspective being in Parliament when we were locked in. I, I was actually the senior detective at the time, and um, yeah. Interestingly, I would argue that the journalists, um, despite there was a huge story, the the journalists that were there with us inside Parliament behaved better than some of the MPs mm-hmm. that were there inside Parliament, um, really and, and were probably that, more no, restrained, no. more restrained than some of the right. MPs. But um, I guess, I guess, I guess you know the the Brexit, the, the COVID thing was probably challenged to some degree because of the nature and personality of Boris as well. That he wasn't someone who necessarily was scripted very well. No, no, exactly. And he was not a details person. And that is a situation where I think one of his advisors said it was the right crisis for him as yeah. such. But yeah. yeah, that's where you do come on where. Like say one word out of place or one stat or just a sort of I think because I think at the start when you know the story was bubbling in January February 2020, but I said oh I'm fine I'm still shaking people's hands and I don't care and it's this yeah. kind of cavalier sort of attitude to stuff which you know that's when it's like look you do need a serious person in this job and people are hanging on your words and they think that you do know what's going on and so yeah I think I think yeah, I was mad he was found out for that yeah. But, you yeah. Know, he was over promoted. He was, you know, being mayor of London is one thing. Being prime minister is a completely different um, ball game. Do you think? Do you think the fact, you know, when he got COVID, did, do you think they could have capitalised a bit more on that piece around his his own personal experience of suffering from it and being able to then to empathise with other people? I don't know. I thought he did quite a good job afterwards. Um, uh, it's very tricky for them because you sort of speak to them. I think it was. Once again, it was critical, wasn't it? I think, you know, when you got put, I think you got put on uh, oxygen, they sort of say you've got a 50% chance of surviving. So I think it was, you know, incredibly sort of stressful and uh, difficult time for them. But no, I thought he did, he did, I thought he did a good job. I mean, his his big thing was always that, you know, you can't, and I can't tell you how or why, but he was one of those people who always managed to have that emotional connection with the public. I mean, you know, I remember going around with him uh, and the cabinet minister after the riots in London in 2011, in the summer of 2011. And Boris had been on holiday in Canada. I mean, it wasn't his fault. He'd been away and the riots happened and he was called back. Uh, we went around Tottenham, you know, which had been, I think, one of the hotspots for the riots. <laughs> and it's obviously um, a Labour area. And we walked around with him. It was like walking around with a rock star, mm-hmm. um, people coming out for selfies. Bear in mind, a lot of people around there probably blame the Tories for the cut, for the riot, saying this is you know a direct result of austerity and the cuts. But people didn't see him in that way; they saw him as separate, um, and that was his big appeal. You know, and you can't bottle that; it's very hard to define it. Um, you know, how many politicians are known by their first name throughout the world? Very few. Um, and he had that kind of stardust to him, which you know, and then allowed that gave him so much more leeway and leverage. Which you know, with Cameron, we were always really. Um, acutely aware of the uh, old Etonian background and the tough charge and you know like how that could you know we really sensed about that how that could backfire on him whereas Boris has got a similar background but kind of almost plays it up more and mm. people don't care mm. just, has, just has more more latitude um, and yeah that's just something yeah. not even the best PR person in the world can sort of manufacture yeah I, I can remember him wandering through Parliament in fact it was it was after he was foreign minister, um, and obviously before he became prime minister, and he was like a celebrity, and even other MPs would just kind of look at him and watch him walking around. It was, and he didn't do anything other than ruffle his hair, but he just had something yeah. about him that was just, I don't know whether you like it or not. He had that kind of charisma that that people respond to. I mean, he would have been a nightmare, I imagine, for you and your colleagues, you know, in terms of close protection, because he was so chaotic. Um, I know even on like visits with him, he'd say, Boris, do X, Y, and Z, this is what's going to happen. Then he did the exact opposite. Mm. Partly just to sort of create that situation of chaos. But I can imagine 
for the close protection officers around him, it would have been a big challenge because mm. it would have been, you know, especially in open spaces, would have mm. been quite mm. quite shambolic. Yeah, interesting character. So, so okay, so now then, what happens? I mean, you know, a, a client comes to you and says, um, "We've got this crisis around the corner. Um, you know, we know something's coming out. What do we do? How do you kind of?" take them through i mean is there a, is there a process is is it just instinctive how do you how do you manage that scenario i mean it's very much just not a one size fits all and it 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 will depend on you know the situation who they are so yeah i suppose it's like what are the preemptive steps you can take first um you know if you're a big corporate as i said like your internal communications is as important as your external communication um you know what are you doing to reassure whether it's your customers or whether it's external stakeholders or investors you know you need to be speaking to them first or warning them because everyone always hates a surprise um if you're transparent with people up front before something happens then you can sometimes lance the boil and then it's thinking like you know can you actually prevent this or is this a bomb that needs exploding and i think the benefit that people have now so if you're if you're dealing with a high profile celebrity or sports person in in the past um and someone comes to you it could be a national with a uh, story and you sort of think right well, let's give give the comment now you can go on your own terms you know people have you know, have someone on instagram you'll have three or four million followers and that's more people than read the sun you know probably times four go actually want to get on the front foot you want to control it our way you want to put a statement out like this and you then you go like actually you don't have to do a TV interview if you don't need to we can do it video you can do it expansive like this it won't get edited out um, uh, and we can control the narrative there there may well be uh, merits in terms of doing it through a newspaper uh, be that whether you want to carry favour whether they are um, whether you've got some alignment in terms of campaigns and values so yeah it really really depends on the situation and what's happening but certainly you see things move a lot quicker now. So you've got to really have that sort of as many preemptive measures in place because stuff can, stuff can implode quickly. And, you know, like if you're a big brand, people can vote with their feet and boycott your store very quickly. You know, if you are, you know, if you've got lots of investors, they can pull the plug on you if they're not happy. Um, and like you say, we live in this sort of instantaneous culture where people are looking to make judgment calls quite quickly. So yeah, it's, it, it just depends on, depends on the situation. Um, uh, and what's happening. Um, you can probably predict sort of 80, 90% with some experience about how things are going to unravel, how things will unfold, depending on what actions, what steps, um, what steps you take, um, yeah, uh, in, in this situation. And, and how do you manage misinformation? Because we're moving into that world now, aren't we, where the next, I suppose, let's say 12 months, we're going to have, I think it's somewhere like 60 elections across the world. Something like 2 yeah. billion people are going to vote. But let's just take the UK and the US as two examples there where, you know, we know there was some suggestion previously of, of Russian intrusion or whatever else in the late in the US elections when Trump got in. But we're going to we, we now know we're going to see deep fake videos and deep fake audio and all that sort of stuff coming out. How, how how is there any way we can manage that? How do we manage that? I think there's that you think that's a massive problem because it's going to be a whole campaign going on on WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, which won't even see the light of day or, or face the full force of scrutiny from traditional media at all. And um, I don't think we have a, a succinct or coherent plan in this country. Like what is going to be the big fact checking organization that people can verify stuff against? I don't think, it's your point, we're talking about um, young people earlier on, like there needs to be more done around, you know, sort of sourcing and literacy in schools about how to corroborate and fact check stuff properly in this situation i think you know what's your question so what what it's like what can you control because you can't control everything so for the government their own channels become even more important and actually it's the one benefit the tories have the power of incumbency so you know soon as prime ministers can use x can use instagram can be using youtube to pumping messages out there which can bypass the mainstream media so that is the one advantage they've got in terms of controlling the narrative but for brand that's what i was saying earlier on Brands and how they use their own platforms are going to become more and more important and saying, look, this is where you get the unvarnished truth. You, you know, if it's not on here, then um, don't believe it. I think also corporates have to do a lot more myth busting, putting up those Q&As on their websites and doing that, but also using their social media platforms a lot more. But I don't think 
um, enough has been done to tackle fake news. And obviously now AI is going to power that tenfold. It's a lot easier for the Russians to pump out um, all this fake news. And I think also politicians have a real responsibility not to use that term unless it actually is fake news. You know, kind of Trump was a sort of uh, godfather of that term and coming up with it. Sometimes you see politicians throw it around with reckless abandon when actually it's more like, no, that's a matter of conjecture. You might not agree, but don't be lazy and call it fake news. Um, but I think it's a massive problem. I don't think we've dealt with it uh, or have a plan for it at the moment. And you, you sort of see this, you know, as you know, there's websites in America where you can ask a senator or a governor any question and then, you know, AI will give you a response accordingly. And we've seen that, you know, I bet you there will be videos of Starmer, Sunak telling someone to F off in the street, um, which will be fed around. Everyone will be like, oh my God, that's absolutely disgusting when it never happens. Mm. But you know, that may never that that may never be subject to the traditional media giving it full force of scrutiny. Mm. Um and obviously less people are watching traditional media, you know, watching the TV news by appointment, reading newspapers, where people get their news sources becoming a lot more fragmented. So it's difficult. I think social media platforms need to step up to the plate and they haven't. And I think for Meta, the algorithm is far too profitable for them. They have paid lip service to this. Mind you, only when they had their feet held to the fire, they should be doing a lot more. X should be doing a lot more. Um, you know, you've seen the BBC now. I've got this BBC Verify um, sort of section on the news now to try and corroborate it. But I don't think um, I don't think uh, there is a plan. I mean, they even had a situation where Sky News had a clip of Sunak when he was accosted in the street. He was talking to this woman, and an edited version went out. They were playing, basically looked like he walked off as she was still talking to him, mm. when in fact he hadn't. But that went out, and they, they put it out, and correspondents were tweeting it out, and actually it misrepresented the position completely. So I think it's really, really tough, really difficult. And um, I think the Germans have got... And I'm not an expert at this, but they've got, um, I think you could be hit with a 40 million euro fine if you've got something fake or something demonstrably untrue on your website. You don't take it down within 24 hours. We need more draconian measures here and we need a plan. Like during the election, there needs to be, you know, almost like the government sets up a separate fact checking body or some bodies that go like, go here and you can use this as a safe space to check stuff because mm. I think it's really, really worrying to threat to democracy. And it's a lot easier, isn't it, for the Russians now to infiltrate with social media in a way before it take a lot of effort, mm -hmm. wouldn't it, to spread disinformation, lies, real, really, because actually now it's quite cheap to do it, and that's that's the worrying thing. But also, you know, from from an, a from a commercial perspective, in terms of the kind of clients you're maybe dealing with as organisations, you know, a, a you know a, a thirty second clip of the CEO or someone significant in the business saying something. Yeah derogatory right now about you know israel or about palestine or something which can be completely fake um travels around the world the share price drops you know you get protest actions you know i, I know that some of the protest stuff that goes on around mcdonald's is based on complete nonsense but even even that mcdonald's cannot get that message through partly because some people just aren't listening but they can't get the truth out there around around some of these myths and so it must be, you know, if you're an organisation coming to someone like yourselves, it must be terrifying when you when you've got to face that type of that type of bullshit about you. Yeah, I think, and I think you're right. Like you could see it with supply chains, couldn't you? Like a rumour being spread that you know, I don't know that, and obviously this is not true. That Primark, uh, you know, point people to thirty p an hour in Asia or yeah. something like that. You know, right? And I think this is where, like, not even just around platforms, but then where brands, as much as possible, and companies need to have their database, build up the database obviously would be GDPR compliant, but to be able to sort of communicate and channel that message out to people when something like this happens, just go for the avoidance of doubt. But I think it it also requires to point um uh twenty four hour monitoring because yeah something can like I said fire can be being lit in the other part of the world. Um and by the time you wake up there could be irreparable irreparable damage done. So yeah, absolutely. So how how do you you know how do you deal with that with a client though? You know, if 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 this fake video has gone out with it's you know twenty seconds long about something how how can you, you know, is it via social media? Is it on their website? Is it a combination of different things that that just try and correct the story, knowing that not everyone's going to believe it? Yeah, I think it's it's um, it's speed. So, like I said, it's using multiple platforms to get the message out. They're in platforms. 
uh, but also traditional media. It's communicating directly with your customers really quickly, communicating with your external stakeholders. And obviously there is a case on these things about getting the information taken down, mm. depending on what it mm. is off the platforms, knowing about people and moving quickly. Then there, you know, there might be a criminal element to that, and there's where you're going to have to involve the police to move quickly, and sometimes lawyers. Um, but yeah, in those situations, speed definitely kills. Uh, but like you say, it, you know, it could be it's, it's a watching it's a watching brief, right? Because you may think you've killed it, you know, in the hour, but then it can erupt, mm. you know, twelve hours later. That, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think they've got to be incredibly cognizant. But also, I think. You know, the other thing which brands need to be aware of, it, this also comes down to how they conduct themselves, right? So, um, you know, they, they probably have to, this is why it has to be more transparent on some of the stuff they do so people know that actually when it comes to gender pay gaps, they've got a very, you know, a very front-footed policy that they check their supply chains and they make sure there there isn't sort of labour being abused and they're not paying 50p an hour. That you know they do uh, this when it comes to the environment, and sustainability. They, they donate this much to charity, or they do this outreach in the community. So it does require people to be a lot more front-footed and having to do a lot more um, than they traditionally used to. And you know, brands traditionally were very conservative, and you know, didn't often want to. You know, the world has changed because often most corporates wouldn't really give a political view, whereas now a lot of them, you've seen them stepping into that space, which is still a minefield. Some of that's coming from the bottom up, though, from staff putting pressure on them or, or them thinking they've got to have a view. And that's where it comes to a judgment call on stuff for them. They've got to be very careful, I think. can be a case sometimes, but it's got to align with values and you've got to think, how does it fit into your overall longer strategic aims, not just a quick tactical sugar rush hit to get, just to sort of get a bit of, bit of media. But yeah, I think, you know, you know, and as you're seeing with um, cyber security attacks, I mean that's happening more and more. I think that's a big problem for for brands and companies. And often, you know, they won't say they've been hit um, because they don't want to sort of create that domino effect on confidence. But they are, and um, often you know, they are quite can be slow in terms of. And there's you know, especially where that sense of panic can freak stuff out, of course, mm. yeah, existential problems. So, so how do you make the balance then between? Um, you know, if a story is breaking, whether you kind of you kind of let it go because you know it's going to be replaced in four hours by something that's much more interesting, and therefore you don't want to kind of stoke the flames and keep the story going. How do you know when to respond to that type of story and when to just say let's just leave it because actually no one's particularly interested and it's going to go away? Yeah, it just depends. I mean, if you are cold, bore, and the wrong then the advice is you need to get everything out at once, right? Dump it all out, all in one go, lance the boil. The worst thing with crisis is when more and more information keeps dripping out, right? So it's like, what are you doing to get this out? But then also, it's like, what are you doing to rectify this to ensure that's not going to happen again? So it's lance the boil, be transparent, be front-footed, um, do as much as quickly as possible, Obviously, sometimes you might know what the news agenda is coming down the tracks. So that can be, you know, for instance, we had the budget yesterday. Do you know that, you know, maybe you want to get the story out on this day because the news is going to be back to back. It's in the business world, the budget. So this is a good day to get it out. Or like, got to do this. Um, uh, uh, and then we should move on. You know, I think it's sometimes when things are um, speculative or there can be low level rumors, sometimes there can be a case for not responding um, because you're going to give it more oxygen and it's bullshit and it's by someone on Twitter who's got 10 followers, like leave it alone. Mm. Um, uh, but it is, yeah, definitely, like as ever, it's a case-by-case case situation. Um, but in these situations where you are in trouble, it's when people try and be too, I suppose, legalistic sometimes, where the apology is qualified, which can be absolutely terrible, where you don't show any empathy or emotional intelligence, where you aren't, stri- where you aren't straight with the public and where you don't set out a robust solution infrastructure about how you're going to make sure it doesn't happen again and whether you need to have an inquiry about it. So, you know, I think, yeah, I think, you know, often quite a few things in corporates, you've been putting in place the infrastructure um, uh, to help with a lot of these things. You know, you can have your messaging ready if X, Y, and Z happens, or at least the holding lines ready to say, look, mm-hmm. we're looking into this, we're doing this, we're going to update you every hour. Sometimes it's like, we're going to update you every hour. Uh, even if you haven't got any updates, but we're going to continually communicate with you because then to our earlier point, it tackles the whole rumor and speculation. Go, look, we're speaking to every hour. You only listen to what we've got to say. You're going to get full candor from us and we will front stuff up. Um, it's leaving those big gaps 
often in the news agenda, which can just um, fuel the speculation that things can get worse and worse. So, I mean, I'm not suggesting people would necessarily um, talk the way they talk, but when you get, you know, you get a celebrity and you get what is very clearly a legal statement that's written by the written by the lawyer or something, who you just, you know, and you can just listen to it and think that's clearly not come from the the client, the person who's in in the trouble. It's it's written by a lawyer because he doesn't even know half those words. It, you know, is yeah, is is that exactly. is that a kind of where it, that's where the emotional intelligence comes in, and that's where it doesn't feel real or genuine because because it isn't real or genuine. Yeah. It's come from a lawyer, not for the person. Yeah, and it, it lacks because you know people. If it's a celebrity, they'll have their big fan base, so they'll know how they speak. So it's got to be authentic, and it's got to come from them. And actually, sometimes it doesn't need to be completely polished, but it's got to be authentic, and you've got to show empathy and contrition, and depending on what the issue is. And if there isn't anything, any legal implications to what they've done, then actually, you know, like you say, it could be counterproductive. And you know, the the sort of crises that get worse are the ones where there's a qualified apology, where it's too legalistic, where it's mealy mouthed. Um, uh, where they haven't actually, you know, they're just doing it because they're forced into doing it. Um, you know, and the question often in these situations obviously is, you know, as you said, if you know the story is going to happen, do you go first on your own platforms? Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's a very good case for doing that and getting it all out. Um, uh, and yeah, and you know, um, you can you can recover from that. I think it's interesting. Right? I would say that the climate. Uh, it's interesting. The states. I don't know what you think. Everyone loves a redemption story in the States. So you're allowed to have one mm-hmm. crisis in the States, one scandal. Everyone likes to come back kid. I think our culture here is less forgiving yeah. uh, when it comes to that. I think it's difficult for people to come back. I think there it's seen as part of part of the sort of journey, part of the passage, and they quite like the redemption story. Um, whereas here it's 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 tougher. Yeah. It's a more of an unforgiving environment. Better. Yeah, there's a whole thing in the US where if you fail in business, as an example, that's seen as a tick in the box, a positive, because you've learned from your mistakes. If you if you fail over here, it's kind of the you know the, the you know the kind of nail in the coffin. You know they just write you off, and that's the end of it. Um, so they see failure in a very different yeah, no, way I, that we do. I, I think we could learn a bit from them about that because you know if you create that kind of environment, it, it makes it people become more risk averse. Mm. Um, you celebrate success less. You see, they they celebrate success more over there. Mm. But I think in a good way. You know, you should be mm. people are less squeamish about earning money and that kind of stuff. So I think in our, um, you know, our culture is such that you know you shouldn't be too showy about that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, different different environment. And I think you know, obviously, our press is less powerful than it once was, but it's probably still the most hostile. You know, I think in a good way, press in the world. But you know, something catches fire here it can be quickly caught fire in other places as well. You know, you see that, you know, and you've got News UK and the Murdoch Empire, which obviously has got tentacles around the world. Something that's here can quickly be in the, you know, New York Post, whether it's on Fox News, it can travel around the world really quickly. So I still think this is the toughest media environment probably for people to to operate in. And I used to find that when I did politics, when you had sort of different prime ministers and their teams come over here, they were, quite surprised it's sort of shocked by the level of sort of hostility and the fact we're less deferential mm. the media is a lot less deferential than it is in other places mm. so looking forward what, what what do you kind of predict what what do you think's coming down the track in terms of crises and and obviously we've got the, the, the u.s election we've got the, the uk election but outside of politics in terms of crisis communication where where do you where where do you kind of see things going um, look, I think the level of volatility and uncertainty in the world is only going to increase. As you said, I think half the world is going to the polls this year. And that volatility feeds into the business environment because people are going to be less likely wanting to make decisions or to invest. They're going to sit on the fence in the meantime. Uh, but also, you know, if you're a big corporate, you don't want to come under the eye of regulators or politicians this year in a bad way, especially if it's going to be a change of administration or people want to make, um, um, uh, make an example of you. But I think, look, we like disruption is a new norm. New norm. Um, uh, uncertainty is just going to continue and increase. So I think for the corporates and the brands, as I said, they're going to have to be a lot more front footed. They're going to, have to be cleverer, smarter, agile with how they use their own channels to get information out. I think people are going to be held to a higher standard. So corporates um, have to be a lot more proactive. And so they've got to make sure that they've got their house in order uh, when it comes to how they treat staff. and. Um, what they're doing around sustainability, 
and how they conduct themselves in the marketplace. Um, I think you're seeing, you know, a lot more, even the regulators becoming a lot more interventionist, whether that's because we're in an election year um, uh, or not, but you are seeing them sort of, uh, I think, stick their nose into a lot more things so that for some businesses that can be, you know, that can be incredibly damaging if people aren't careful, even if they haven't done anything, but they're being investigated, it obviously creates that kind of uh, sense of panic around things. So I think that's a big issue. And I think um, the need to be aware and alive to monitoring what's out there is only going to increase more and more and more. I think in terms of communicating to your to your to your base or whether it was to your marketplace is um you're gonna have to be a lot more sophisticated and it's not one size fits all so yes it'll be you know if you're taking the uk market yes it's important to be in the papers from a credibility point of view yes it's important to be on the bbc but some of those tailored news letters people get into their inbox so whether it's political whether it's about business whether it's about property are becoming more and more important that's how people are consuming their news i think Martin Lewis, MoneySavingExpert.com. His email gets it's got five million subscribers or something like that. Really high open rates. Um, he's the most trusted man in the country. He was when we did polling a while ago because he saves people money. But I think that is much more how people are consuming news, that tailored news into your inbox. So people kind of need to understand that. Um, and it might be for some people that, you know, because as ever, it's not always about volume. It's just about hitting the right people. Um, like those can be some of those newsletters will be much more important than being on the BBC or Sky or whatever because you're hitting your core demographic um, in there. So yeah, you've got to be a lot more targeted in how you do things. Interesting, really interesting. Gels, thank you so much. I, there's um, there's a lot there, and I'm interesting just on that last subject. That's that's uh, that kind of concept of newsletters and blogs and things like that. I think is something mm-hmm. that. You know, for even someone like myself, a small business person, that you know, that's I where. I say, like, you would have really interesting insights, and maybe it's something you do once a month. Do you know what I mean? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We do it weekly. Um, do you do it weekly? You're oh, now on our list, by the yeah. way. Just so you know, you're getting it every Monday morning now. Oh, awesome. Yeah. No, that I, I would enjoy reading it. Um, but yeah, no, it's interesting because I think um, the Telegraph now has 30 newsletters. Um, Politico, I don't know if you follow that, but that's been an incredibly successful business model. And it's a bit like, I suppose, do you follow football? Yeah, Marshall? yeah, yeah. Sadly. Like the athletic model. Yeah, the athletic yeah. athletic model, yeah. all or nothing. It's like people will pay for certain things if, they, if it's a passion point and, you know, behind the scenes, kind of how the sausage is made. So I think that is that is where stuff is going. Um, so, yeah, no. It's, but, but is there a risk then of... of, of... Of us only getting the news we want to read rather than actually getting yeah. a more kind of wholesome story. Absolutely. I think you can very much exist in an echo chamber. And I know I'm probably guilty of that myself. Sometimes the people I follow on Twitter, I try and follow people that I don't agree with. Um, I don't really, I think generally as a platform, it is a, it's not a place for nuance. It's quite shrill. And I use it as a new source than anything else. But I think to try and, to use it to convey complex, nuanced arguments, you are you are losing whatsoever. But yeah, there is there is yeah definitely um, a danger of people exactly just getting what they want to hear. Mm. And to my point, I don't think people are doing enough to be questioning the veracity of sourcing of material. And I think it's interesting. I think in America, as you do have like you generally do not see a news story that hasn't been triple sourced. Oh. Whereas here, you can definitely get stories being run. On one anonymous sources and it's interesting in america they don't really like having um uh, anonymous sourcing at all they they do a case take it they want people in the record whereas here obviously if you read you could read a front page political story which is completely anonymous sourcing mm. it's not mm. one person on the record mm. um so so yeah i think it's it is something which um I know we're not on top of yet yeah no it's it mean, i can remember being on on various high profile murder inquiries and um sitting on the train going into London, reading someone's story over my, over someone's shoulder and, and reading that every single th- fact they've written is complete nonsense, but everyone's going to believe it because that's the story today. And it's all anonymous sources and all that. It's interesting because someone was saying to me, a uh, journal who, uh, about the Nicola Bully case, you know, that um, yeah. woman disappeared, that actually that the police had got, I don't know if it's true, but because they're so like gone the other way, I suppose, post Leveson and phone hacking, that 
you had all this wild speculation and you've run out of control. Yeah. Whereas yeah. actually if they said to them, look, you think it's, the, the, you know, like she wasn't mentally well or she was an alcoholic, whatever it was, and he wouldn't have had half the media coverage. Um, but like say the speculative thing ran away. Um, but, you know, I can see why equally the police of, um, they're getting so much shit thrown at them, why they'd be very cautious about what they are going to say. You yeah, know, but let's see, I'm, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I can flip that. I, I worked, when I was on, I was on the Damalella Taylor murder inquiry and, um, for a period of time, I did some of the some of the media work with with one of the superintendents, and we would go to these press conferences in Scotland Yard every day. And you would have all these journalists come in, and there was kind of you know a press conference, and then about ninety five percent of the journalists would leave, and about five percent of trusted journalists would stay. And there would be this conversation between the journalists and the police that was yeah. they weren't going to print anything; it was confidential exchange of conversation. And I know yeah. that we had this kind of crime writers dinners and all sorts of things in those days. And I know there's all sorts of, you know, stuff being printed about it, but actually we had a relationship with the media post Leveson and all that, that was, you know, the story was you don't talk to the media full stop. And so that communication yeah. broke down. And I think it was a negative thing. Um, and I think too many uh, speculative stories were allowed to run then because they didn't have that relationship where you could find up the DCI of a murder inquiry or someone and say, look, we just had this bit of info. Is that true? No, it's not true. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I think... Well, how, yeah, I th- it's a stare. How should we treat this one? You go, yeah. look, it's not our instinct, to your point. So then you don't have the panic and hands around. Like, I would just leave it for a bit. We yeah. think it's this. We'll keep you updated. Exactly. I, I'm with you. I think it's a good thing provided, you know, because I mean, yeah, provided money's not exchanging hands. It's absolutely fine. It should be. And it, you'll know much more than me. Obviously, I know they can, you know, when it works well, they can be very helpful, I suspect, you know, Play a role in you know catching people and whatever else. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the police got I mean, terrified of the media. The, the the police became scared of the media and scared and and you know scared of of talking to anyone because you know, am I quoted him on this and what have you? But actually, previous to that, it worked quite well because we had that trusted relationship. And there were particular journalists that you would have that phone call with and say, "That's not true." Honestly, you know, give me an hour, I'll come I'll come back to you with something. But that isn't true. Um, I think we've lost that art of engagement and actually trying and actually a search for the truth rather than just trying to get a front page story. 100% totally. I think, I think there's, um, yeah, I mean, I think even like applies to politicians in the sense that they should, they should have the full force of scrutiny, but we can't be treating everyone like they just be beating their wife up. There has to be a more of a middle ground with a health account, but you don't have any respect for the institutions of public life. We're never going to get good people doing it, as you know, so it just ends up doing good people doing it and, trust just goes down even further doesn't it so yeah yeah i think i think it's absolutely a two-way thing thank you for listening to the diffuse podcast with host philip rendell ceo and founder of diffuse please rate review and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms